I am so pleased to introduce Catherine Morris, uh, one of the co-curators, uh, along with Aruna D'Souza of Lorraine O'Grady, Both And, which opened at the Brooklyn Museum in 2021 to rave reviews, uh, got a lot of attention on national press, uh, and uh, then traveled to the Weatherspoon Art Gallery at UNC Greensboro. Uh, and uh, before I give her introduction, I actually am going to um, call your attention to a few publications uh, that complement the exhibition. I brought show and tell to encourage you to go to the library uh, or the Davis shop, but they're in the library. You don't have to buy them. Uh, of the beautiful catalog that uh, Brooklyn Museum published along with the exhibition, co-edited uh, by Morris uh, and D'Souza. Uh, it's a really important scholarship uh, to help you understand the exhibition. Uh, there are also beautiful essays by Stephanie Sparling Williams, who's also at the Brooklyn Museum now. Uh, and uh, so you can find uh, uh, Williams is writing here. She'll also be speaking as the Backwin lecturer uh, March 5th, I believe it is, here at Wellesley. Uh, she also has a monograph uh, on Lorraine O'Grady that I know many of your, the students in the room will find helpful for your research. And uh, D'Souza was originally supposed to be with us today and unfortunately uh, couldn't come, but I wanted to call your attention to her important editorial work on O'Grady's uh, collected writings, writing in space. Uh, so along with what you're learning here today and what you learn in the galleries, um, these are three important books, all relatively recent publications. Uh, that will help you continue to teach and learn uh, with O'Grady's both and. So Catherine Morris is the senior curator for the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art at the Brooklyn Museum. Uh, one of, I know everyone in this room's favorite places to go see art. Uh, the Brooklyn Museum, but the Sackler Center specifically. Uh, since 2009, she's curated and co-curated some of your favorite exhibitions as well. Lorraine O'Grady both and, of course, but also We Wanted a Revolution, Black Radical Women, uh, 1965 to 1985, Judith Scott, Bound and Unbound, uh, and Materializing Six Years, Lucy R. Lepard and the Emergence of Conceptual Art, which of course is a really important link to, uh, to Lorraine O'Grady, whose uh, uh, approach to life was transformed uh, by Lepard's book, Six Years. That's really what inspired her to become a conceptual artist herself. Morris uh, has worked on projects examining contemporary practices through historical precedents precedents, including uh, the recent, also splashy show, uh, it's Pablo-matic, Picasso according to her, uh, Hannah Gadsby, and the museum-wide Sackler Center 10-year anniversary project, the Year of Yes, Reimagining Feminism at the Brooklyn Museum. She's worked on exhibitions and curatorial projects with Mary Enoch Elizabeth Baxter, Beverly Buchanan, Eva Hess, Suzanne Lacey, Marilyn Mentor, Zanelli Muholi, Nellie May Rowe, Lorna Simpson, Kiki Smith, and Cecilia Vicuna, and uh, she has also produced historical exhibitions such as Twice Militant, Lorraine Hansberry's Letters to the Latter, Newspaper Fiction, The New York Journalism of Juna Barnes, 1913 to 1919, and Healing the Wounds of War, The Brooklyn Sanity Fair of 1864. Sanitary. Oh. That's different, yeah. I did just call, like this is, FYI. It does say sanity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but it's very different. Um, <laughs> but wounds of war, the Brooklyn Sanitary Fair of 1864. We are all that much more intrigued. Um, <laughs> Morris was a curatorial organizer for the Brooklyn Museum presentations of Frida Kahlo, Appearances Can Be Deceiving, Radical Women, Latin American Art, 1960 to 1985, and Seductive Subversions, Women Pop Artists, 1958 to 1968. 
Upcoming projects include, I think we're lending for this actually, Elizabeth Catlett, a revolutionary artist. I'm pretty sure one or two of our friends are gonna be in that. I have to double check our, our loan request. No, no, I, I, if, if, I'm, if it's the right one I'm thinking of, we're saying yes, but. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Elizabeth Catlett, a revolutionary artist and all that it implies. So that opens September 13th. So it must be the one I'm thinking of. And Nona Faustine, White Shoes, opens March 7th. Previously an independent curator, Morris organized, among other projects, decoys, complexes, and triggers, women and land art in the 1970s at the Sculpture Center. Hans Hoffman, 1950, at the Rose Museum at Brandeis University, another of our favorite neighbors. We love the Rose. Nine Evenings Reconsidered, Art, Theater, and Engineering, 1966, for the List Visual Arts Center, MIT, another favorite neighbor. And two exhibitions, Gloria, another look at feminist art of the 1970s, and Food, at White Columns, New York, and finally, Confrontations, the Guerrilla Art Action Group at Printed Matter, New York. We're so thrilled to hear directly from you about this important exhibition that you co-curated uh, and look forward to hearing what you'll tell us. Thank you. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. For, it's a, such a such a pleasure to be here. Such a pleasure to see both and again in its newest incarnation. Um, thank you. And so I will start with um, some thank yous. I'd like to thank Lisa Fishman for supporting this exhibition. Also, um, Semenchi for organizing the programming for the exhibition We're here, and including the symposium. And of course. Professor Nikki Green for curating and, tr and her truly extraordinary long-term support of Lorraine and her legacy. Um, also, thank you, Amanda, um, for both this visit and more importantly, for this exhibition. Uh, and of course, to the entire team at the Davis for making the presentation, which is beautiful um, of both and. It is a remarkable experience uh, to develop an idea and then to see other committed thinkers take it up and build on it. Um, I have always been uh, committed to the ideas that exhibitions are not definitive. The best exhibitions are not definitive. The best exhibitions generate more exhibitions. And um, you'll hear more about that during the course of my talk. Um, in this case, the idea of the generative is more specific to this exhibition project, um, but it, because it is something that's generated again from the same exhibition, but it is also incredibly rewarding to me. I would also like to take a minute to express Aruna's gratitude. Aruna couldn't be here today, unfortunately, as a family priority made it impossible for her to join us. She asked me very specifically to thank everyone for being here, and um, especially, of course, Lorraine. Uh, and don't worry, you'll be hearing a lot about Aruna during this talk. Uh, if you've had the pleasure, and I'm sure most of you have, had the pleasure of seeing the show already, you know that the concept of both and is a highly important one to Lorraine O'Grady's thinking. I should start with a slide, shouldn't I? Um, closely aligned with her ideas about the conceptual fun functioning of the diptych form, the dual phrase both and effectively starts conversations that break down binaries and open up space for, for subjectivities the dominant culture has long effectively diminished and negated through the intellectual structures of either or thinking. The concepts and space that Lorraine's use of both and allows is also an excellent way into examining the form of politics she has spent 50 years trying to make room for starting with an acknowledgement of the value of the subjective personal experience in environments such as this one and others, which have long and effectively built armatures of control under the guise of being about things much more important than the lived experience of any one person. In that spirit, I would like to start today with an anecdote that demonstrates how directly Lorena Grady's lifelong project implica implicates me, both personally and structurally. This is an image, by the way, of the um, opening of the installation um, at the Brooklyn Museum. That um, angled wall that you see is kind of interesting here because we opened our show during COVID 
and we really had to think about how to try and kind of um, move people through the space in a much more structured way than I think we would typically have done, but in, in an effort to kind of keep people sort of separate, we make this angled wall, which was um, actually had a quite nice effect. But anyway, back to me. Um, in 2002, before many of you were born, Ingrid Schaffner and I co-curated an exhibition at the Alternative Space White Columns that was just mentioned. Um, White Columns is a long and illustrious uh, nonprofit space in New York City. The exhibition, called Gloria, another look at feminist art of the 1970s, got a fair amount of attention in laudatory press. It's one of the first exhibitions that I co-curated. And obviously, the fact that my curating, it speaks to my feminist bona fides, my mainstream white feminist bona fides, because Lorraine was not included in Gloria. It would be another five years before her work would literally open the much more important exhibition, WAC, Art of the Feminist Revolution, curated by my colleague, Connie Butler. In many ways, that, shows, that show launched a new chapter in Lorraine's career. But back to my show. Here I quote from a review in Art Forum by Martha Schwendener. What goes unsaid is the fact that all of these women, save Yoko Ono, Adrian Piper, and Anna Mangieta, were white, middle class, and looking around at some sexy pieces by Linda Bengelis, that's part of that cover image you see there, and Hannah Wilkie had bodies, or in Mary Kelly's case, babies, that fit the model of beauty proffered by the patriarchal mainstream media outlets against which these artists rebelled. Needless to say, it was not a surprise to me to find a pointed critique of our show among Lorraine's papers in the Wellesley Archive when I came here to do research in the summer of 2019 with Aruna. Though, of course, I was also secretly thrilled to learn that our show had even made it into our archive. Um, the position, I'm going to change this because that's, that's the broadside that we published for this exhibition. I'm going to go back to this image. Um, the position paper I found was called, All the Women Are White, All the Blacks Are Men, But Some of Us Are Brave, which Lorraine was prompted to write because, to paraphrase, a recent spate of feminist shows had prompted her to think about the ways in which the current recuperations and celebrations of the, mo of the movement appear to be repeating the problems of the movement itself. She asked several questions in relation to the moment that the Gloria exhibition happened. And to again paraphrase. With reference to the movement's current recuperation, what does it mean to curate a smart, critically applauded exhibition on the feminist art movement that manages to completely elide the movement's heterosexism and racism? And how can historicizing and problematizing proceed side by side? As you will know from your own work, with Lorraine's work, there are any number of intellectual threads I could pick up here to begin to talk about Lorraine's work in earnest. But since I'm a curator, I'm gonna talk about Lorraine's writing in relationship to the exhibitions and her work in relationship to the exhibitions and presentations of, work, of her work that I have participated in. The important thing to note here is that while writing in various forms has, was the focus of Lorraine's creative practice for many years before she took up visual art making, and that moving beyond writing into space was the thing that generated decades of her genius, writing has remained by vital necessity at the heart of her work. Some things to keep in mind as we keep move through the exhibitions of Lorraine's work that I'm about to share. Lorraine has always been looking for a discourse that wasn't there. In order to make, find, and contribute to that discourse, she needed to simultaneously make it and write it in real time. Lorraine's subject is her own subjectivity, of course, and this means that Lorraine's work itself becomes a recurrent subject of and locus for new work. Per her questions about my show above, Lorraine always strives to simultaneously historicize and problematize her own work as she produces it and revises it. This is her never-ending circular conversation. Turning to being here today at Wesley with all of you, the deep, deep thinking about and knowledge of Lorraine's work that I've already seen <laughs> in the 18 hours that I've been on campus um, makes it clear that I'm really just here today to talk about curating um, because all of you have already displayed so much thinking that has inspired me around Lorraine. 
Which brings me back to being implicated, um, this time in a more structural way. Let's talk about the first feminist show when I did finally get around to including Lorraine. And that was this exhibition. We Wanted a Revolution, Black, Rav Black Radical Women, 1965 to 1985, an exhibition I co-curated with Rejekyll Hockley, who's now the curator at the Whitney Museum. This is the opening image of that exhibition. Um, it was an exhibition that was developed in relationship to the 10th anniversary of the Center for Feminist Art, um, the Sackler Center for Feminist Art. If anybody wants to talk about that at the end of this talk, I'm also happy to do that. I don't want to have any elephants in the room. Um, and um, it was an exhibition that really built on an idea that I had. I, had been cur I have been curator at the Center for Feminist Art since 2009, also before probably some of you were born. And um, when I started there, I think that a lot of people assumed that what I, my job was to do was to give monographic exhibitions to women of second wave feminism, feminist art history, as it were, um, that had never gotten those shows. That was really not my interest when I arrived, and at that point also I think I could point to any number of amazing colleagues, some of you here in this room, who are also doing that work. So for me, what was really important was to think about feminism as a methodological approach for looking. One of the things that I love about the Center for Feminist Art is that it is in a historical institution like the Brooklyn Museum, so that as far as I'm concerned, everything within the institution is an opportunity to think methodologically about how we look through a feminist lens. In that process, over my first few years there, the other thing that became very clear was the um, need to um, expand the conversation around feminism and to take stock, as I sort of just did in my own history, about the ways that feminism didn't work. White stream feminism didn't work for a lot of women or a lot of people. And what did that mean? And what were the other stories that we could tell to participate in a very important, as far as I'm concerned, the most vitally important work being done today about making a better history and making a better history of feminism in my case. And so the idea for We Wanted a Revolution came from that notion. Um, you'll notice that the word feminism is not in the title of this show. It is a word that I think is problematic for a lot of people. It is a word that doesn't work for a lot of people. It's interesting to me that um, we live in an age, I think, where we're so interested in changing language and finding better words for who we are and how we live and, and how we function in the world. And yet the term feminism has never changed. There's never been a, 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 another alternative for that word that has taken hold, and that's kind of interesting to me. There have been suggestions, womanism being an obvious one, um, but somehow the word. And so when we talked, Rue and I had a meeting with the artists to make this exhibition, uh, we heard very loud and clear from a lot of the artists that feminism was not a word that applied to them. That didn't mean, of course, that what they did or what their interests were or what their history showed was not feminist. So the word radical seemed much more important to the women artists in the exhibition. Um, the title of the exhibition actually came from a colleague of mine, the head of education, because most of the most radical ideas usually come from education. Um, was our head of education, Radia Harper, I was telling her about the show and I was, uh, talking about, you know, wanting to change the world. And she, I had this memory of her. She, like, smacked her hand on her desk. And she said, we didn't want change. We wanted a revolution. And then we got the title for the show. Um, that was long-winded. Um, the works in this, we opened the exhibition with, and then I promised to talk about Lorraine. On the wall, behind, on the wall we see this amazing work by um, Faith Ringgold, homage, um, excuse me, for the Women's House. Uh, work that is now on long-term loan to the Brooklyn Museum, which I'm thrilled about. It was, does everybody know about this work? Does anybody know about this work? It was a work that, um, that Faith made when she got a CAPS grant in New York City and she wanted to make work for the people who needed it most. And those were, in her mind, incarcerated women on Rikers Island. And she worked with women on Rikers Island to come up with a thematic uh, subject for a painting that she has called The Long Road Out of Here. And um, so this exhibition, for this exhibition, we got the painting out of Rikers <laughs> and um, installed it um, as the opening of our exhibition, along with a great work in the front here, um, Marin Hassinger. <laughs> a Marin Hassinger work, which, like so often happens with the Brooklyn Museum, is now in the collection of MoMA. <laughs> MoMA bought it while the show was up. Um, 
Ouch, it happens a lot. I try and take it as a compliment, right? Um, so this exhibition, as it says, really focused on writing a history of black feminism between 1965 and 1985. Um, Lorraine was, and her work were a pivot point in this exhibition, not only because Lorraine work, work, Lorraine's work functions, I'm getting very nervous because Lorraine is here, um, and between that kind of 1965 to the mid-1970s era from black power into conceptual practices into what another not so useful word, but it's kind of a shorthand postmodernism um, that Lorraine represents. And her work really operates as a pivot point and tr um, transition between. Um, we were lucky enough to include the actual figure of Mademoiselle Bourgeoisie Noir, who we've heard a lot about today. I'm also going to let you in on a little secret. We call this MBN. So you'll be hearing me refer to it as MBN for the rest of the day. Here you see MBN installed in a gallery with a wonderful group of extraordinary pieces, bringing attention particularly to that small video piece you can see in the back there, um, a wonderful work by Blondell Cummings. Um, we included in the exhibition a section devoted to Just Above Midtown and its importance and started really, um, Lorraine really appears in the exhibition in multiple places, um, in this case in the archives of JAM which was a wonderful um, afternoon Rue and I got to spend with Linda Good Bryant. Um, I'm looking up at Janet Henry, who's also here, who was in that show and was a part, is absolutely a part of this history. Hi, Janet. <laughs> and um, yes, yeah, so somebody mentioned earlier Lorraine's entree into the world of jam as a uh, person using her writing to support Linda Good Bryant and her work. Um, writing press releases, uh, drumming up press, um, the famous, also mentioned earlier today, phone call to, I believe, the New Yorker, right, Lorraine, when you realized that the person you were speaking to on the other line didn't know that you were black and instigated this moment of realization of post-blackness. Um, a wonderful juxtaposition with that is an article that um, links um, Maren Hassinger and Betty Saar, and as you can see, I think it was Betty that wrote on there in the red pen, uh, just pointing out the ridiculousness of this review that linked the two of them over nothing more than the fact that they were both black women and that their work has nothing to do with each other. On the right, we see some examples of the Heresies archives and the material in, that, in the exhibition that also featured Lorraine's work including one of my favorite pieces of her writing about her dreams, um, and also her participation in um, various issues of heresies, including the conversation um, that resulted in uh, Arch Is. We also included River's First Draft. It was a very exciting opportunity for us to present the work as an entirety. And what you can see here is that River's first draft and our installation kind of wrapped around the room to include, um, to, it was juxtaposed across the way from Lorna Simpson and from Carrie Mae Weems, who were the youngest artists in the exhibition, again pointing to Lorraine's pivoting between these generational conversations in ways that really um, linked um, a history. And one of the things that I have to say that, that Lorraine said to Rue and I when we were, we gave her a tour of this exhibition, which was I think the most important thing that Rue and I heard in, during the entire exhibition was, she's here, I don't know if I can quote her, but <laughs> was the idea that you said you felt that you had seen a new, yourself in a new history, or as a part of a new history that, that you hadn't seen quite so lo laid out before, like in an exhibition form. And, and for the two of us, that was um, just a really important moment. One of the things that also happened, um, in the making of We Wanted a Revolution is, first of all, most of the artists we spoke to knew that if their work was going to exist, they needed to maintain their own legacies. And obviously, Lorraine is the ultimate champion of that. And so the work that we did was within so many extraordinary artists' archives. And this notion of um, these women artists really being the guardians of their own legacies, and what did that mean? The other thing we realized is, per my earlier comment, that as far as I'm concerned, the most successful exhibition generates more exhibitions, um, we realized that there was a lot of shows that hadn't been done on the women artists in this show. 
And in thinking about what that meant, um, Rue was off to the Whitney at this point, um, Lorraine was the artist that I thought of that needed to be the first in a series of exhibitions that really pull from the history that this show started to tell and to focus more intently on individuals within those histories. For all the reasons I just described, the way that I understood Lorraine's um, place in that history, the moment in which she really functions between um, the sort of activist moment of the 60s and 70s within feminism and within um, black identity into what postmodernism and conceptual art, all of these framings felt very important to me. The exhibition that, um, that Amanda mentioned earlier that I did, had done several years earlier on um, materializing six years, Lucy R. Lepard and the emergence of conceptual art had pointed to me the ways in which conceptual artists were often described as being not political. That also came up earlier today in the student work. And artists like Lorraine proved that conceptual art was inherently political, or I should say the best conceptual art is inherently political. Not all those guys were political. Um, and so Aruna D'Souza, enter Aruna, a colleague and friend of many years, she came to me after she had been working on her book, um, Whitewalling, and had met Lorraine and said, we should do a show on Lorraine. And um, that was that. And uh, the museum very quickly got behind it, which is not always the case. And um, yeah, I remember we met Lorraine. We did our first studio visit with Lorraine the summer of 2018, it must have been. And, um, and one of the first phrases that I heard that Lorraine wanted to talk about was both and. And so again, in a situation that doesn't often happen, um, the title for the show was almost immediately uh, clear to all of us. The other thing that was really interesting about talking to Lorraine around how to organize an exhibition, right? How do you organize a linear exhibition or a nonlinear exhibition about an artist whose obvious historical life and experience is very much laid out and clear, but whose very work is continually in the process of reframing and reforming itself. How do you get into making space for that kind of creativity and that kind of um, space? Because that's what Lorraine is asking for in her work. She's looking for an expansive conversation and the best ways to work into a, an expansive conversation that begins with the subjective. And so, River's first draft was the idea, and it was Lorraine's idea, because as you know, Lorraine has called this her most um, feminist work, which I still sometimes think about. It's another conversation. Um, and also that it is a collage in space. And I love this image, this juxtaposition um, with this idea of collage in space. We didn't talk, we talk about Lorraine's work in formal terms a lot, but what we don't talk about often is relationship to the more, to more traditional forms of formal conversation. And now when I look at this juxtaposition, for instance, or the juxtaposition downstairs of the three images of the woman in red spray painting that piece of furniture progressively, is Lorraine as colorist. <laughs> and when you think about this work as collage, which Lorraine asks us to do, um, suddenly you can sort of begin to think of like, you can sort of extract formal um, images from the work and see it repeated over time and understand this as collage in a more formal conversation that I feel like has not really been addressed and I think is fascinating. The other thing I love about this work is we have the woman in white here and then we don't have an image here of the, um, yes we do, the Nantucket Memorial which also opened the exhibition and to me begin this idea of the diptych that becomes the fur palm. You have the two characters in this work that represent both of those sides that Lorraine then very metaphorically puts together later in the fur palm. Again, here, the color in these works um, and the kind of abstraction that it can offer and the repetition of the figures, even though we're thinking of it primarily as a performance, I'm just fascinated with thinking about what Lorraine means when she says collage, like literally. What does it mean? What does it look like? And that's been a really fun part of the process that has been inspired by being here, I have to say. And then we have cutting out the New York Times. We did begin the, we did follow a loose, um, we did 
open with cutting out the New York Times, obviously very important. We were also incredibly lucky to actually have access to the original um, collages that Lorraine made and kept, um, that we had conversations about being sort of source material or actual art, or how do they function as ephemera or as documentation. And, and it was important for Arun and I that we gave people the opportunity to have that experience with the object itself, that kind of, you know, Walter Benjamin idea of the aura, which I really feel like is fully present in why ephemera is so important in this exhibition, one of obviously multiple reasons. And so we set these up in cases much like you see here in, in the exhibition. I should say that if you haven't been there, the Feminist Center at the Brooklyn Museum is composed of three primary galleries. And so what you'll see in these next ex slides is um, the kind of progression around those three galleries. Those galleries, by the way, surround the dinner party. And I hope that you will take notice when you read the ephemera in the exhibition that Lorraine also has some things to say about the dinner party. <laughs> and that's important. And it is something that as a curator who is functioning within a space that comes with that and all that it represents, um, it is such a welcome opportunity to have a conversation and to think through with an artist like Lorraine and to try and think about how to make visible those points of conversation. Uh, we also had, as you all have, the, the, uh, the vinyls of the Cutting Out the New York Times in various locations in our elevator lobby, and um, the haiku diptychs as well. We also had a really great sweatshirt that had the Dracula diptych on it. I should have brought it and worn it. When we first started talking with Lorraine about the exhibition, the idea of MBN as a trilogy was something that um, I was really hearing for the first time. And it was interesting in Amanda's tour earlier today, I hear the ways in which when Amanda talks about it, I think that that's even changed and been expanded upon since, um, since we installed our show. And that's another example, I think, of what's interesting curatorially to see to get to work with other colleagues and see what they do with material, but also speaks again directly to Lorraine's own continual recalibrating of an idea within multiple forms within various bodies of work. Um, again, I'm not gonna go into the descriptions of all of these work. I know you all know them very well. If you have questions at the end, we can take them. Um, okay, I'm gonna put Amanda on the spot. So, when we were in the tour, you said that um, Lorraine sees the MBN trilogy now as MBN proper, the performance, as Identify pointing, sorry. Identifying the problem. Identifying the problem, which is quite interesting to me because, as we know, there's two performances of MBN, right? One, which is definitely identifying the problem at the new museum, one at just above Midtown, which is identifying a different problem, but those things then in that, were in that framing, which I'd never thought of, become a diptych, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we move on to um, the black and white show, which is... Who should the artist be? Who should the artist be? Again, that diptych structure between black and white, which is fascinating. And then third, art is becomes, who should the audience, should the audience be? Um, which doesn't have the diptych for me yet, but everything else does. So there's some work to do. Um, but I find that fascinating and is not the way that we were thinking about it when we installed it. We definitely were thinking of it as the, the diptych because Lorraine had definitely identified that. Um, I also just love this juxtaposition of scale. Um, obviously, this mural, Toxic Junkie, very large external outside work um, against what is effectively in the exhibition a small um, postcard, but the representation of, of um, Piper and Piper's relationship with Lorraine and their um, conversations as fully present in the documentation here. I just think that's a kind of nice juxtaposition. Um, so art is. Um, we installed it, like at, this is an installation shot at the museum with some of the very well-known images, um, including the one at the lower right, which shows uh, Lorraine with her own gloves pinned to her T-shirt. I was tempted when I was given a pair of white gloves last night to pin, to pin them to my sweater, but that felt a little presumptuous. Um, 
And I want to thank Dr. Gray, who this morning brought us a conversation that really introduced a whole level of kind of um, a centering of personal spirituality in relationship to this work that I had never considered before. And when she talked, she showed this image. Does it work? This is the image that she showed. And what I thought, when, because she first showed the, the description of the different kinds of um, levels of consciousness, in a way, and then showed this image to talk about it in relationship to art is. And I thought, that is so fantastic, because not only are there the two frames, in front of Lorraine, representing multiple kinds of states of being. But she's standing in front of that enormous frame behind her, which is this representation of this entire community that's also part of this conversation that she's engaged in and thinking about in relationship to um, self and the multiple ways that we find, um, I want to say healing, in a way, in self. And um, so that was just a wonderful morning, a wonderful moment this morning for me. The last room in the center, in the feminist center galleries, included um, the cutting out the conit and um, the entire installation of Body as the Ground of My Experience. Uh, in this case, one of the things that Arun and I grappled with, as some of you in this room may have, is when you're working on Lorraine O'Grady, the idea of adding your own words <laughs> to Lorraine's words feels a little bit like Coles to Newcastle. Feels a little bit like, really, I'm going to have something to say? And, um, but on the other hand, the other thing that we learned with We Wanted a Revolution, where the artist first told us two things, that they wanted to tell their stories themselves, but they also are artists. They also want curators. They want people to talk about their work, right? So um, we talked a lot about how we were going to write wall labels for this exhibition and whose voice those wall labels would be in. And ultimately, we decided not to include Lorraine's voice directly anywhere but here, with the body as the ground of my experience, because Lorraine, as curator, wrote the wall labels for each of these pieces. And we felt like that was an important way in which we could point to that part of Lorraine's practice and have it be present conversationally with the work that then Lorraine and Janae Daria, our curatorial assistant, were then doing. So here we get to the part that's most exciting to me within my role in the Brooklyn Museum. I mentioned earlier that um, for me, I often think of myself as a dilettante in the Brooklyn Museum because all I want to do is like get with other curators in the institution and talk about feminism or talk about how we can talk about feminism or gender identity in relationship to multiple collections, right? And um, when it came to doing a monographic exhibition of Lorraine O'Grady, not only did we need more space, just flat out pragmatically, we needed more space than what the Feminist Center offered, but we had this opportunity that Lorraine brought to us to think about how to engage with our historical collections in a truly extraordinary way. And um, that, was one of, that has been one of the most rewarding um, opportunities I have had as a curator. And here you see the first of these inter interventions um, where we installed miscegenated family album within our ancient Egyptian galleries. Um, the Brooklyn Museum um, Egyptian collection is, a, is one of our strongest collections, one of our most historical collections not only temporarily for the art object, but also for the institution itself. And um, we own Miscegenated Family Album. We're very proud to have this work in our collection in its entirety. And we had worked with Lorraine previously and had installed parts of it before, several years earlier in the Egyptian gallery. So we had a little bit of kind of a dry run on that. Um, but this time, we got to install the entire uh, series within this context. And um, Lorraine thought closely about where she wanted them to be and how she, the collections that she wanted them to be in, in conversation with. Um, and as I just pointed out earlier to Amanda, the diptych that you see on the right um, is taken, is a detail taken from, from a work in the Brooklyn Museum's collection. So we're particularly proud to be able to have that um, that work in our collection and to have been able to show Lorraine's work in proximity to the original. As Amanda also pointed out, and it's interesting, right, because of the Davis, you have historical collections too, right? So we have Lorraine, in this case, installed in galleries sort of below all of that history that then goes on above. Um, 
which is also very important to me. I feel like that's another thing that people who come to the Sea Lorraine show can do and engage in <clears throat> and participate in. But for us, it was, we just were really lucky that we were able to, um, to really expand out, to really think differently about how a monographic exhibition can exist in an institution. It doesn't have to be discrete. It doesn't have to be separate. It can really be um, contained within all of the other history that it's referencing and talking about. Nefertiti Devonia Evangeline, we represent as you do in this, in the exhibition here in a, in a series of ephemera. Um, as we know, it was one of the last pieces Lorraine did before she took a break and had to come back to Boston um, to be with her mom. And then uh, we come back to the next body of work after, but it was nice to also include this work in that context. So we had this work installed in addition into the, in the exhibition, in the Egyptian galleries, excuse me. This was one of the most challenging installations we did, but it was one of the ones that I was most excited about. And it was to put landscape Western Hemisphere directly into our American landscape galleries to really um, make the work function in relationship to painting. I don't, wouldn't say that it functioned as painting, but it definitely functioned in relationship to painting. And again, like it functioned in relationship to scale, right? It functions in relationship to this notion of <clears throat> this grand idea of American landscape painting as, as expansive and as taking in broad vistas of obviously implied ownership. Um, and in this case, we have the really direct conversation that you can then have about particularly the soundtrack of Landscape Western Hemisphere, which is so wonderful. And so going back to that notion earlier of the calming, sitting in that room that you have downstairs and just listening to the, to the, the audio of that piece, it, it always is so moving to me. And to have that audio in this context within these paintings of this close-up of Lorraine's head, of the back of her head and her hair, and it moving like trees or like wind um, was just so beautiful. This, actually, this was one of my most exciting moments when this actually worked. Lorraine came and made us make it bigger. <laughs> <laughs> we had had it installed, and it looked beautiful. But Lorraine came in and sat at the, I sat. I remember you came and sat at the bench looking at it for a little while, and you were like, no, make it bigger. <laughs> and luckily, we were able to do that. And guess what? It made it better. This was the first installation of the <clears throat> announcement series that Lorraine had been working on for a number of years at that point. And that uh, she told us about in our first meetings with her, but we didn't actually get to see any of the examples of it for quite a long time. And so to have the opportunity to install them and to sh show Lorraine's first new performance work in decades was quite special. And to install it within the context of our European painting and sculpture galleries, again, also um, kind of reinforced so many of the stories that Lorraine told us about the making of this work. Um, in relationship to Rodin, but also in relationship to her own memories of, um, of being a student, of being a child and being kind of babysat by the um, Boston Public Library and reading books about Joan of Arc and the, uh, the figures of that history that resonated with her and fed into all of these decades later the making of a work that in which Lorraine is fully present, but is not visible. And so for the first time in her career has sort of produced this body of work that is all about this external power that she's in conversation with as a black woman. Um, and yet what you see a couple of times is her eyes and they are um, truly powerful and moving. And so to install these works was just a real, extraordinary opportunity to think about what the implications were for our institution and what the, what the sort of systemic conversations are that Lorraine is asking of us. Um, I think, yes. And so then um, 
going back to the earlier conversation about, um, about the idea of the collage, after looking at these works, again, we start to talk about, to my mind, I start thinking about color, and I start to think about abstraction, and I start to think about the idea, oh, I thought she was going like that at me. Um, <laughs> wouldn't be the first time. Um, and so I suddenly, I've just had so much fun here today listening to people talk about the work and then walking through the exhibition and suddenly just looking at the work differently. And so for me, seeing these works again, um, after River's first draft, I started thinking about these in relationship to collage and in relationship to, uh, to the kind of formal components of abstraction that I hadn't really thought about before. And when I was seeing them much more in the context of the idea of performance. Um, can I talk about the performance? No? OK. Um, <laughs> um, and then, so in that case, I think we have one more photo. Oh, no, we have this photo, which we just had a great conversation downstairs about studies for flowers of good and evil, which um, we wanted to include in the exhibition Arun and I did for a number of reasons um, in casework. In part, as I said downstairs earlier, because um, it's one of the works as an entree for a lot of people can um, feel very important in relationship to, um, to Olympia's Maid. Um, and I felt like that was, there's ways in which we wanted to think about how to make Olympia's Maid visible and present in our exhibition. And um, this is one of the works that I felt like did that. And this was also a last minute addition to the exhibition, which was very exciting. We wanted to include, we wanted to bring Lorraine into another part of the installation, into the museum. This, if you haven't been to the Brooker Museum, is kind of a corridor, which is actually a cafe um, that leads to the main gallery, the main elevators to all the other floors. And we realized, we realized suddenly that the um, ratio of the windows was the right ratio for the paper for cutting up the New York Times. And from there, we were able, with Lorraine's um, approval, to make these works on our walls, on our windows, um, that you could see from both the inside and the outside. And it was just such a wonderful moment of um, levity as you walk through this space. You know, we talk a lot with Lorraine's work, obviously, about the idea of binaries and how constricting they are. And um, we often say the binaries of, you know, nature culture, rich, poor, black, white, male, female. One of the other binaries, particularly in relationship to another exhibition I recently curated that Amanda mentioned on Picasso, um, another binary is humor and seriousness, right? <laughs> and um, it's another way into a conversation with Lorraine is the fact that um, both of those things absolutely um, often need to exist at the same time. And so I bring that up here just in the sense of a kind of lightness. There was something about this installation never having been done before and what it meant to sort of do it on these windows and to kind of just have the freedom granted um, with Lorraine to, to, to do it. It works. Take advantage of it. Um, that was just really rewarding, especially for a lot of the staff in the museum. I think in a museum like the Brooklyn Museum, we spend so much time dotting every I and crossing every T before we do anything um, because there are so many different people and departments and um, needs involved in putting any exhibition together that um, to sort of do this uh, was just for everybody a very exciting moment. This is the last in, um, image. I don't know if Lorraine has seen this image, but um, as I mentioned, both Anna um, opened at the museum during COVID and the summer of um, 2020, or 2021 must have been, um, the museum was basically shut, locked down, and we wanted to, um, we did a project called Art on the Stoop, in which we did a series of projections outside of the museum over the course of the summer for people to sort of encounter on the road, on the street, on their way home, where they could come and sit and, and, um, and experience a, a, a series of, of videos. And so uh, I was really excited that we were able to um, present landscape Western Hemisphere in this context. The idea of, lands, of Lorraine's notion of landscape and what that means um, in terms of hybridity, in terms of diaspora, in terms of cultural specificity, once again takes on a very particular reading in, you know, um, in central Brooklyn. 
and in a community that would see this work and um, understand the kind of wonderful conflation of the, the idea of hair being expanded into this idea of landscape. Uh, and we also, I don't know if you can see it here, but in the image on the right, you can see there's these steps in front of the museum. There's, um, there was also installed at the same time, we had um, an installation on our steps by Carrie Mae Weems, which was another wonderful moment of um, conversation for Lorraine with this project that Carrie had done um, about um, COVID at that particular moment. And that's an hour or so. I'm sure you've all heard enough out of me. I will say, just in closing, because um, Amanda mentioned it, um, the next exhibition that is coming out of this idea that uh, prompted by We Wanted a Revolution of the kind of monographic and the kind of expansive history of, um, of feminism um, is uh, the project that she mentioned that we're working on that opens in September, a monographic show of Elizabeth Catlett, one of the oldest artists in We Wanted a Revolution. Um, so I'm very excited about the um, further opportunities that we have to, to play with um, this offering of this narrative and um, other exhibitions that can grow from, it, grow from it. But I am particularly just, I'm always so, um, it makes so much sense that we started with Lorraine O'Grady. It makes so much sense that from an exhibition like We Wanted a Revolution, we would be able to focus on producing a monographic conversation about an artist who in so many different ways touched on each of these histories and earlier histories to really point to, um, you know, I think that the 20th century in terms of feminism is so often described in this model of waves, which is enormously inaccurate and enormously cumbersome and sort of not useful. But one of the things that I think that Lorraine offers us and that is growing with, for me as a curator as a result of it, is to think about long history, right? long generational history and generational conversations and the ways in which, there's so many ways in which institutions like the Brooklyn Museum that there's two things we do that are really problematic. I mean, there's many things we do that are really problematic, but two that I'm thinking of in relationship to this. One is this idea of discovery models that we often have with artists. This idea that first, the other thing, the first, why is being first so important? I think it's much more important to be able to find the ways in which you can acknowledge where you come from and who you're building on. It's a much more rewarding, I think, place to be um, engaged than with some idea of being the first at something. And so I think that one of the things that Lorraine's lifelong project offers us is multiple ways into those conversations. What is the contribution? What is the unique? additive part of the work and what is it that the work is springing from? What is it that the artist valued that needs to come with them into this conversation? And that's what makes uh, the fact that we were able to do this first monographic project in this idea um, with Lorraine O'Grady and that we're all here today. So thank you very much. You promised you were going to come up here with me for questions. I, I did. <laughs> come on. Any questions? Thank you so much for that presentation um, and just for sharing, especially the, the process involved in um, telling Lorraine's story um, and at the Brooklyn Museum in an appropriate place. I really appreciated the way that you shared your curatorial in interventions and innovations by exhibiting certain works that were in conversations with works that you have in your permanent collection. And I wanted to ask, um, you, I guess, together, but, but Amanda, in terms of the installation here, had you thought about doing something like that at, as well? I think much of the show is contained um, in the space on the lower level. 
Um, and we've got that, you know, wonderful performative frame um, in the entrance. But I, I just thought of if that's something that you considered and, and how you even might think about, you mentioned the Catlett show coming up, that there are other ways that that might have multiple lives within the larger institution of the Brooklyn Museum. And, and the last thing I'll say, this may be just a comment, um, I was, you know, there for, for Magda Compos's show that just came down and it also had, I think, a really thoughtful, special place um, within the Brooklyn Museum. So just wanted to, to, you know, compliment you on that, but also just ask questions about, um, you know, what, what you've also um, done here, which is absolutely gorgeous, and I'm, I'm going to run back over to see the show before the museum closes today. Thank you. So I thought a lot about how the Brooklyn Museum had done uh, the exhibition, and of course we received uh, organizational materials on how the sections were divided and titled, which cases go to which sections. Uh, and I really admired the conversations uh, that you uh, generated between Lorraine's work and the parts of the long-term collections. Uh, uh, but we knew we wanted to present it differently as well. Uh, and I, it, uh, I, when I was on the Brooklyn Museum's website looking for traveling exhibitions in fall 2021, and was so excited to see that both and was traveling, uh, and I, uh, I, I was, I was had Chan, the Chandler Bronfman galleries. That's what our basement galleries are called. In mind, I was looking for an exhibition for that space. Uh, so my f first way of imagining it was for that space. We did, of course, just undergo a year-long construction project during which all the long-term galleries were all deinstalled, uh, and so we did have a few conversations at one point because. Um, uh, of deinstalling galleries, like might we think about using those differently at some point, uh, but not necessarily to install them with a long-term collections and, and put Lorraine's work in conversation. Um, but uh, most of our planning has been concentrated on concentrated on Chandler Bronfman, uh, and we stuck to that space. Uh, Mark Beeman, my colleague, who uh, leads our exhibition design, and I worked really hard uh, to uh, abide by the sections. <laughs> uh, and because uh, there are a lot of cases and a lot of sections. <laughs> um, and uh, have it be a navigable exhibition with a lot of walls in that space. Uh, so we, uh, it was challenging in that way because we're so thankful that Lorraine has, has made uh, so much work and uh, that uh, the, the bodies of work are often so expansive, uh, like rivers alone. Um, so uh, we really concentrated on bringing it together. And I've been saying to people that I, I, I admire the conversations of the Brooklyn exhibition so much and I'm really jealous of everyone because it was peak COVID, I'm among the people who normally would have seen that show. And I didn't, I wasn't going anywhere in spring 21. Um, and I uh, am really jealous of everyone who gets to see both versions because they're both, so as you were saying, so generative and like help you think through the work in different ways. And I'll also add that when, um, when the show went to the Weatherspoon, Lorraine was very clear that, you know, there was no need to do that, that the exhibition exists, you know, fully in the white cube space as accurately and as comfortably as but anywhere else. For the Weatherspoon, so I, I, I'm uh, friends with a couple of people who are at the museum and, and on faculty at Green, UNC Greensboro. Am I correct that they, that took over the whole museum, right? Did they, they did not have other long-term gallery spaces. I, it's my understanding that both and mm. was the entire Weatherspoon for that semester. Is that true? I'm not sure. I think it is. <laughs> I, I, I will come back to this late. Ask me tomorrow. Not tomorrow. Ask me Monday. Uh, but I, I, I'm pretty sure that both and was the entire Weatherspoon, uh, which is po so powerful in its own That's way. It's a different kind right? of powerful, right? Right? It's yeah. the whole museum. I'm, I'm almost positive, but I'll double check with my colleagues. Yeah. And to, to answer your other question, you know, we often talk about ways that we can... Um, 
One of the things that I say that I think may be true here as well for Lorraine's show, but in relationship to the Center for Feminist Art, the, which is a unique space, my goal is that if you leave that space and you walk into any other place in the institution, what you've just seen has an impact on what you look at subsequently. And I think that that can certainly happen because the history that's present in the conversation that Lorraine is asking us to enter into with her um, go with you. So I, I do think that. But we have not really done it that much in in other exhibitions. You know, I think like most galleries and like you, we do have interventions with of of material from the permanent collection in multiple gallery spaces. The only other time that I can remember that I did it is that Kiki Smith, when I did a show with her, it was actually my first show at the Brooklyn Museum, um, she installed some of her kind of puppy, puppet figures and did a lot of installations in some of our period rooms, which was also very lovely. Other questions? Barbara. Um I think the show was fascinating and beautiful, so very well done. And I was wondering, you know, looking at photographs of performance art, we're looking at sort of the echoes of something that was ephemeral. And I'm wondering, just in reflecting on that type of art, like, is it best to think of it as we're seeing just a small sliver of it that we could never recover because it happened live in a park or wherever and it was an incredible moment and it must have been so fun and we're seeing just, you know, as I said, the echoes and that's the best that can happen. Or do, are you kind of implying today that in a sense, maybe from the beginning, the artist is thinking about how the ephemeral will eventually be the static or the serial and that this, in a sense, is another form of the art, maybe even as profound. I'm just curious sort of on how you exhibit performance really with photographs. I mean, it's a question that curators grapple with all the time for sure. Um, I think there was a moment when performance was first emerging in the 60s and 70s where that was very much in question. Um, and, you know, I think about some of the most famous performance images that most of us know were done by the, a photographer who happened to be in downtown New York called Peter Moore. But, Ultimately, those photographs are as much about Peter Moore as they are about those performances, and they've become very conflated in a lot, of, in my mind anyway. Um, I think artists have become increasingly aware as performance has become more institutionalized and historicized about how to manage that. I think that Lorraine was one of the first people to um, conceive of these um, larger photographic documentation projects that come out of the material of the performance so that they are not, it is not documentation per se, it is, um, it is an evocation by the artist in a very specific way of this event through the multiple lenses that she's asking us to look at it through. Um, the exception to that, and it's not really an exception, it's also true as I think about when Lorraine told us about the um, that there was not, she did not have the money to have a photographer for Art Is. So in a way, she described, you know, seeing people on the street during that performance and like, give me your phone number so I can get photographs from you. But somehow, when you look at that documentation of Art Is now, it looks remarkably uniform. It looks remarkably like a single photographer in like Lorraine. So um, I think that, sorry, go but ahead. That's another way it was participatory, yeah. right? Another way that it's art is, but artists are as well, right? That, that's that such it's a good point. the, the yeah. crowds behind the frames, but also behind the camera. That's something I really appreciate about that. But in Barbara, also, I think MBN is another good yes. case study to answer your questions for uh, MBN's first performance at Just Above Midtown. Uh, Lorraine uh, did not hire a photographer. Uh, and But I think there's also so much value in the ephemerality of performance art, like, because you, you had to be there, you know? Um, right, right. But uh, she very deliberately hired a photographer for the new museum performance uh, and uh, envisioned uh, a the print artwork as well, right? And you can see the contact sheets. Uh, but what I also love about that is that the photographs of the performance of MBM were at the New Museum. But the performance of the joy afterward yes, were at yes. just above Midtown, right? Right, right. It's kind of great. Right. 
I just want to add to your answer. Please. Uh, when Jim Voorhees curated the show at the Carpenter Center, he went to the archive here, and he found visual descriptions from MBN and what Lorraine wanted from the photographer. And she preconceived many of those images and then worked with the photographer to realize them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So helpful. Anybody here want to be a curator? <laughs> Tell us about working with artists. <laughs> and then we'll just stop. <laughs> Sometimes it's better than working with the states. <laughs> Cheryl? Well, it's, it's kind of somewhat like the last question, I think, and I may have missed the beginning of it. Um, but I was just curious, because I was looking at the end, and, and I mean, I just have to say how much I love this show. Um, because as a teacher, and a curator, and a nerd, and I was saying this over lunch, I mean, I, I guess I've been teaching Lorraine's work in the end since the very beginning of my career. Have I seen, like, photo documentation of that performance? No, I'm not an installed anywhere. No, I, I have like, you know, these awful slides from who knows when. And so being able to actually see the work as, um, you know, as, as it's been curated, as it's been presented here, um, as you shared here in the presentation from the Brooklyn Museum, it's a real gift, I think, for everyone in this classroom, everyone, I'm sorry, we're auditorium, but, you know, everyone who's going to have the opportunity to engage with this exhibition over the semester, um, but to us as, as educators to be able to have a sense of the materiality of that documentation um, and, and to get, a, I think, a deeper sense of not just that one, like there's the one slide, um, the one, you know which one I'm talking about, that's always reproduced, but of course there were more. So the question was, or that I have is, was there ever any, in addition to the photo documentation, I know we didn't have iPhones back then, but was there ever any um, film documentation of that performance or, or others? I'm imagining there must be something somewhere. I'm looking at Robert. No. I don't think so. No. There was a River's First Draft, but that's a secret. <laughs> 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 the one thing I'll add to that, Cheryl, that I think is, is interesting is I think that I did an exhibition called um, um, on this series of performances that happened in New York in 1966 called Nine Evenings, which are considered in conceptual and performance art a very important moment. And part of the reason I wanted to do that show was because somebody mentioned Nine Evenings. I'm like, oh, yeah, I know that. But when I thought about it, I knew the two or three photos that were shown over and over again um, but I didn't really know it, and that was actually what prompted me, and I think that that, for those of us in this field who are thinking about things like that, or subjects, um, it's a very important way into histories to, to think about what you know, how much has been given to you about how something exists, um, and how much more there might be that you actually don't know. You know, there's so many moments in art history where we all kind of shake our head because we saw a slide in Art History 102 or something, but then, like, but how much do you really know? And I think that that's part of um, the histories that are most interesting to a, a lot of us right now. Yeah, it's like what you think you know. Sorry, I see. Yeah. What you think you know, or what you what 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 we what we know from these again. And that's why I was saying photo documentation right. because I think it just begs the larger question around you know around performance and um, and you know whether with nine evenings like you know. Do we just want to remember nine evenings? <laughs> right. 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 Do we have and what are we kind of just sliding past in the process? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I was going to ask a question, but I, I will follow on that comment and then ask the question. Is that while we are talking about performance, I think of Lorraine's work more in the context of writing and chapters. Mm -hmm. And you describe that, that they're not per se documentation of, or performance documentation as we understand 
that to be. I think that the images are so specifically selected and the narration that happens in the context of, of how she envisions the images, for me in itself creates a whole a new intention that is very different than the original performatic intention. Absolutely. Um, so that's just a comment. But the question was, uh, I know that the Brooklyn Museum maybe 20 years ago was one of the first encyclopedic museums to begin to think about uh, not disciplines, or I think it was one of the first museums that stopped dividing curators per department, right? And with the idea that all curators had different um, specific fields of study, but that there were n the divisions were not going to be as strict uh, as say MoMA is divided. And I wonder if with this show, because it, it so easily her work so easily fits into the different aspects of the collection, historical, recent. Uh, the connections are very much there, so I would imagine it was not necessarily hard to work with the curators of such disciplines. But how do you see that in the context of curating the show and how in the development of how museums have evolved in understanding the connection between contemporary art and the history of art? Um, a couple things. We still very much keep have departments. We, you know, as many of you know, the original term for curator was keeper. And so we are still keepers of the works of art that sort of function within our departments. Um, but we are intentionally collaborative. And we have, in the last 20 years, as you Im imply, been very much instructed and in inclined to, to work very collaboratively not only in terms of exhibitions, but also in terms of acquisitions, in terms of sharing space, in terms of thinking about what conversations we can have across departments. One of the things we would love to have done if, if Lorraine's show hadn't opened, for example, during COVID, would have been to have each of the curators of those different departments do a tour of the show based on her work in their collection. I mean, those are the kinds of things that I think open up really interesting conversations to hear a European, talk, European curator talk about the night, for example. Um, or to hear Stephanie Sparling Williams, who is now our American curator, she wasn't then, but or she, no, the end she was, um, talk about Lorraine's work in the context of, of our larger American um, installation. So those are the kinds of things we, we really do try and look for. Um, where I thought you might have been going with that for a second, which I think is also a, an important point of pride at the Brooklyn Museum, is that we were one of the first historically collecting institutions to present African art as art and not as anthropological artifact. And so that's a part of the history of the institution that I think is significant. And we're trying to, to build on that now. And we have, is this something I'm not supposed to say? I'm not sure. Um, you know, we're looking at ways of very intentionally reinstalling our African collection in relationship to our Egyptian collection. I, I think that's known. Uh, yeah. We're in the field yeah. of it. Well, we have I mean, yeah. renovating space. We're plan. We're in the planning stages of renovating state. Yeah. I, and what is done is uh, about through four years ago, of course, uh, there Kristen Windmuller Luna yes, also absolutely. had a really great installation of African art all over the Brooklyn Museum as well. You know, so that's another instance of of. Uh, uh, of a single project that extended right. in different long-term Oh, right, totally, galleries. totally, absolutely. Yeah, Thank and, you for bringing that um, up, yes. And you brought up yesterday, which I think is so amazing, is the um, Pitchy Patchy's costume in the night in its relationship to a Gungan. Yes, yes, which I haven't asked uh, Lorraine about, but it d certainly evokes for me a, a formal illusion of this very important kind of Yoruba masquerade tradition in which uh, the cloth uh, is uh, connecting the living to ancestors, right? Because cloth outlives us all. And uh, so, it, you know, certainly in, in Caribbean carnival, like there's like direct diasporic links, but I'm really interested in that uh, potential formal illusion as well. And I love that idea being extended to the idea of Sir riding around on his bike to collect those ties from secondhand right. stores, and right. the way that right. and the way that Lorraine insisted that the dress, the, the gloves for the MBN costume were worn. Right, you know? right, absolutely, absolutely. Like connecting bodies across time is what textiles can do. Yes, and I also want to extend your response to Ursula's uh, question about like the uh, like multidisciplinarity of uh, the Brooklyn Museum. Of course, uh, as I ranked last night, it's part of the reason. 
I was so excited to see you were traveling this show and wrote your tour um, manager right away uh, because as uh, an academic museum where we work with every department on this campus, uh, Lorraine's work uh, is um, so, so inviting for so many different disciplines. And we uh, uh, have so many disciplines and uh, alums from different fields, faculty in different uh, fields who participated in the ebook, of course. We have several authors in the room, which I realize we haven't recognized today. So ebook authors, there's just a few of you in the room. So you have to raise your hands really high. <laughs> Rhonda Gray, uh, Joy Bowman, and Amani Higginson are all here among the 19 authors. And more are here this morning. And uh, in even more uh, departments will be teaching with the exhibition during the semester. Uh, and it's precisely because of uh, the expansive uh, intellectual approach to uh, her writing, to her artwork, and that, uh, and, and globally historic moments and interventions into different disciplines uh, that uh, uh, we're able to achieve uh, what are always our goals, right, uh, with this exhibition. Yes. I have a question. You mentioned uh, an old word for curator being keeper. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you were to try on uh, a few, you know, one word or a few new words in the place of curator. Uh, would you and which ones might they be? And if it helps uh, narrow it down, maybe in relation to um, Lorraine O'Grady's legacy, which uh, you've had such a strong connection with over the years in particular. I love the idea of thinking of another word. And I like the, I really like the word keeper, actually. There's something very um, poignant about that idea for me. But that term reflects the historical um, role, which was keeping objects. So it certainly is a term that doesn't apply to I wouldn't call myself a keeper of artists, for example. And so in the contemporary context, that does change. I also like the, on a sort of snarky level, like the idea of changing the word because I get very annoyed at the free and easy use of the word curating in our world, but that's just me personally. Um, I don't you think too. you're alone. <laughs> I don't think you're alone. You do not curate your spice rack. <laughs> I mean, it does depend on the spice rack. <laughs> But um, that's a good question. I don't necessarily have ideas off the top of my head. Do you, Cheryl? Just I, the other words that we might use besides, it's, the one word that I think is really true, excuse me, um, is that is probably collaborator because curators don't do anything by themselves. The idea that it's an individual activity is completely untrue, so. I may be mis misremembering, but it stays with me since I knew Lorraine when I was one of her students. And I believe she has said many times that art lives in the hands of its preservers. Preservers, which is a variation on, on keeping, I guess. It's yeah. maybe a bit, keepers are probably a bit more vernacular or something, but yes. So we have a new vinyl in the Davis Museum Wellesley Methods uh, section on what curators do. I encourage you all to check it out. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, we've been thinking a lot about what curators do, and the root of curator is to care, right? And historically, that's meant to care for objects in, in the manner of a keeper, of a preserver. Uh, but uh, there's a beautiful essay uh, um uh, by uh, Yasomi Molu uh, about uh, 10 ways the art world uh, should change. The link is somewhere on our website. Serena might be able to tell us where to find it. Um, but uh, she makes a really good point that curators today cannot care only for objects, but also for people and need to care for people in the museum, people working at the museum. Audiences people coming into the museum in equal measure um, or more, you know, that the objects are there for the people. Um, so uh, care uh, is an important part of curating. Uh, and uh, yeah, part of the reason uh, I wouldn't be quite ready to give it up, but I do like collaborator too. 
No, it's a very important point. I think the idea of keeper was also very much if you were a keeper of Renaissance painting at, you know, whatever British museum you want to point to, you know, you were not thinking about audience. If you were thinking about audience, you were thinking about the two other scholars in your field who, you know, you talked to. Um, so, or didn't. Or, or didn't. competed with. <laughs> 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 Um, so yes, the idea of audience, and that's another um, directive that I think comes from the uh, development of contemporary practices in the past 30 years as well, is the idea that the, you have to have a viewer to complete the object in some way. Mary? Um, I want to put a plug in for if... Lorraine is ever interested in performing her uh, work with the knights or knight that um, and she wants an audience she should share it with uh, with Wellesley because I think there'd be a great deal of interest especially if there if the work isn't going to be videotaped so I just wanted to put a plug in for them. Thanks Mary. It always helps to ask. Yeah. <laughs> Rhonda, do you have a final question? Oh, <laughs> I'm putting everybody on the spot. Um, which, which must be, oh. I oh. my torch, so it's kind of selfish. But um, for those who are still in here, we wanted to know if um, Devonia Benjamin, if there's a video uh, of that performance. I, uh, Robert? I don't believe so. Yeah, Ursula, it no. It shown a couple places. Oh, it has shown one. It shown, I believe, at Luke Cole. Um, no, but that no, was uh, Mademoiselle. There is a video of Mademoiselle being dressed, yeah. but not Devonia Evangeline. And the photographs oh, that okay. exist are only yeah, those six. Oh, no, no, no. The images. Yeah, those are Lorraine had hired a photographer, but the, I don't know what what happened with the t with the film. I think but there only those six. Or something like that. Is yeah, what she said. that's all that exists. Yeah, yeah. It's just the That's what I thought. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I do have one final one question that is for, for both of you because the archive plays such an important role in the, in the show and I was walking through the space again. But of course it's the archive of a living person which is such a unique example and I know Lorraine is very ahead of her time in having donated and detached herself from the archives before um, you know, ages, you know, years ago. So I wonder if you could just speak of the difference between working with an artist's archives when they're still living, if there is a sense in which the archive is speaking in a different manner. And I, the archive in, West, in, they, in Wesley has such an important role all the times. And I think for the Brooklyn Museum was quite different. So if you could just speak from your perspective, so how that informed your, your selections or the way that you were thinking the archive was articulating something that the work was not. Well, I can start by saying I, I virtually have never done an exhibition that hasn't started with archival material. It actually makes a lot of my colleagues at the Brooklyn Museum angry. No more documentation. We don't have any more cases to put stuff in. Um, but your question is a really interesting one. It is an amazingly generous and generative opportunity to be able to work with the archive of a living person, to be able to engage with them in the archive and then to also talk to them about outside of that. And that was absolutely the case with Lorraine. You know, uh, the essay that I wrote in the catalog that you very kindly showed earlier really grew from two letters that Lorraine wrote to Lucy Lepard that are in the archive. And to be able to talk to Lorraine about those letters and why they were written then and, and sort of the implications and kind of the back and forth and kind of what comes after is an amazing opportunity. Um, having said that, to work with more historical archives is also just extraordinary to feel like you can hear somebody's voice through time. But to hear the voice of a person who's still, li still living through time is, is really pretty wonderful. Absolutely. I really don't have much to add after that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you all.